So how do we model and how do we think about estimating the question that we've been talking about? Before we can talk about our model, we first have to think about what we call the micro foundations, the games that different institutional actors play in order for us to see the way that financial centers respond to increasing amounts of polyarchy. In the game we model, we assume that there's government and that there are international financial centers in a particular jurisdiction, and that the government can offer a certain supply of polyarchy, which banks then demand depending on incentives that they receive from their foreign investors. And we reflect the strategic interaction of jurisdictions that are all playing this same game internally. Now, as resources come into the country, we see that finance captures a certain amount of polyarchy, a certain share of policymakers' time and interest, or a certain share of power, for lack of a better word. And we depict this political share in figure 13 as this pie you see in the top part of the figure. So as finance receives more foreign investment, we see their political share increase. However, over time, we see that if finance becomes too big and or too uncompetitive, if their share in the overall political process is no longer reaping the political returns that those in power want, or isn't reaping the benefits that financiers themselves want, then there's decreasing returns to this power, and we see the entry of different interests, both politically and economically. We see that finance looks to other sectors in order to provide some of the innovation, some of the finance, and indeed some of the new sectors that finance needs in order to attract capital into the jurisdiction. We see something like supply and demand for polyarchy balancing both internally and externally. Based on the way this game plays out in other jurisdictions in the international financial network, we see that for all intents and purposes, our local banks receive some kind of signal from abroad dictating whether there's an appetite for innovation or dictating whether they just want cheaper finance or finance directed more toward a particular policy, whether that be legitimate, ethical, or what have you. The government's own demand function then balances the political gains from more polyarchy versus the political gains from letting financiers have more capital and power. Figure 14 shows the result of the way these games play out across these jurisdictions as basically the supply and demand for polyarchy. The figure specifically shows the amount of financial assets as the dependent variable and the extent of polyarchy as the independent variable. Namely, the extent of polyarchy is the thing that our political system is choosing in order to maximize the amount of financial assets that our own banks are able to attract so that we can earn profits on those assets and tax revenue. We summarized our argument by looking at two effects, basically an innovation effect and a focus effect. The innovation effect shows increasing amounts of financial assets as polyarchy in the jurisdiction rises because of the new ideas that new interest groups bring and the payoffs that we have to give to these groups that have been waiting patiently for their turn at the pulpit. The focus effect, on the other hand, shows a negative relationship between financial assets and polyarchy, reflecting this theme in the literature and in the empirics we see, namely that increases in polyarchy in the short term seem to correspond with decreases in the amount of financial assets that banks are able to attract. The overall relationship between these two factors depends on the balance, or the average, if you will, of these two factors. And we show one of these averages in our figure, which many viewers will recognize as a Bezier curve, or as a simple weighted average of these two effects. And so what we would expect over time is that as polyarchy increases, so do financial assets, up to a point, Whereas in after that point, increases in polyarchy only dissuade international investors from investing in that jurisdiction. Similarly, we can illustrate the dynamics of our game theory model, as shown in figure 17, through these five plates. If the base case reflects international financial centers just doing their own thing, then we see 
in plate two that as one jurisdiction becomes more focused, it increases assets as shown by increasing links. Other jurisdictions then subsequently increase their own focus namely decrease the amount of polyarchy in their political institutions in order to attract more of these links and thus more finance. After a while, in this race to the bottom, we see that jurisdictions have to increase their polyarchy in order to bring this innovation and new ideas. In our model, we show the benefits of this polyarchy as a simple shifting of these edges or links in the international matrix of financial centers. Thinking about these changes in the line diagram we just showed, we see that as a jurisdiction becomes more focused, it provides incentives to other jurisdictions to also increase their own focus in order to stay competitive. We reflect this as a leftward shift of the focus effect in figure A6 with a decrease in polyarchy and a decrease in our financial assets as we are simply responding to that other jurisdiction. We don't show it here, but in the paper we show that over time we'll see innovation effects similarly shifting to the left, reflecting an increase in polyarchy even though financial assets continue to slide. Over time, as a stock of innovations brings online increases in foreign investment, we see this whole process reverse with polyarchy increasing and financial assets increasing. And eventually in this circle, in this dance, we see that polyarchy and financial assets reach some kind of dynamic equilibrium, keeping in mind that jurisdictions are always acting and reacting vis-a-vis -vis each other. Now how do we test this model? Before we can test the model, we actually have to clean up this data in order to remove effects that we don't want. Figure 7a show how several covariates or several foreign variables can interfere with the analysis that we want to conduct. So as we see in the figure, the quality of institutions would certainly play a role in intermediating this influence. We see the natural productivity of the country. We see that the amount of money the country has could even crowd out the need for foreign assets and thus affect the way polyarchy influences these assets. One easy story to tell might be that as government debt rises, we need more money to pay that debt and thus we seek resources from abroad in terms of foreign bank deposits in order to find the capital we need to service that debt. The performance of a local stock market could also impact on this relationship, namely that if a local stock market's doing very well, foreigners will want to put their money into that jurisdiction's financial institutions, no matter the extent of polyarchy in that jurisdiction's political institutions. Thus, there's a wide range of factors that could influence or intermediate this relationship. And in our study, we actually categorize them into five different groups of variables. How do we concretely adjust the value of cross-border bank assets and thus the value of finance going across a border? Figure 26 shows how we've adjusted this network of cross-border bank liabilities across countries by focusing on the lead investor as well as the way that investment drops off as we rank jurisdictions. So for example, looking at these data, we see that for Australia in 2005, the lead partner jurisdiction, the US, put roughly $35,000 in cross-border bank liabilities into Australia. And we see similarly that if we look at the second ranked partner, the UK, the third ranked partner, the fourth ranked partner, and so on, each partner placed roughly 35% fewer bank liabilities than the jurisdiction before it. And if we regress the largest partner's cross-border bank liabilities, and if we regress the extent of this drop-off, we can arrive at a new curve, if you will, a new relationship between the way jurisdictions put money into Australia. And as we see in this particular circumstance, the value of those cross-border bank liabilities would have increased by three and some odd times, and we see that the drop-off would have been much less across jurisdictions. Namely, more jurisdictions would have given Australia more money. Figure 27 shows the way that we adjusted our international financial center network before making these changes from our regressions and after. 
So if we see a very tight, densely packed network of international financial centers before making the adjustments, we see the after a much cleaner view of these international financial centers. Yet we don't want to just know about the network. We want to know each center's centrality within these networks. Naturally, it's very difficult to depict an investment center's entire network. But what we can do more easily is figure out, well, how central is each network in the international matrix of financial centers? And the way we measure that is through something known as an eigencentrality. Namely, we look not only at how central a jurisdiction is in collecting investments from other jurisdictions, but this idea of eigen, eigencentrality, actually traces through these investment links. So not only do we look at Switzerland's centralities vis-a-vis -vis France, but we also take into account France's links with Australia, Australia's links with Canada, Canada's links with Korea. And so by tracing through every single financial center's financial links with the other jurisdictions, we can figure out, well, how central is Switzerland in this example vis-a-vis -vis all other centers, knowing that all this money is sloshing around these international financial networks. So in some ways this type of analysis is broader because it looks at the entire network rather than just one jurisdiction centrality vis-a-vis -vis its immediate financial partners.